is in the way you have to adjust <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> I heard the master ceremonies talking about cracking this and cracking that. I almost thought he was talking about cracking heads. <laughs> I don't want to call the other part because that is happening too often. Master ceremonies, chair of this evening's proceedings, Shadja Dafir in the embassy of Venezuela to Barbados. Senor Alvaro Sanchez and Mr. Cesar, Senor Cesar Benedetti, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Acting Permanent Secretary, Anthony Wiltshire in the Ministry of Labor and Social Partnership Relations, President of the NUPW, Brother Kenny McDowell, Acting General Secretary, Sister Delcia Burke, other members of the Executive, the National Council, and uh, staff of this organization. Chairman of CITUSAB, President of CITUSAB, Brother Edwin O'Neill, and uh, Brother Dennis De Pisa, General Secretary, the one who we refer to as one of the senior statesmen, Brother Cedric Murrell, past presidents, General Secretaries, and General Secretaries of the NUPW, Delegates, shop stewards, media professionals, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all a good evening to all of you. And as a good evening to all of you. My good evenings, I keep having to say this, my good evenings are not because it is part of a speech. I'm addressing a workers' union. We deal with people. This is not a, a speech. Good evening to all of you. <laughs> right. I want to begin by wishing Comrade Smith well in her at this time. And I think I would want to share with you that the prayers of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are all with her and wishing her a speedy recovery. I want to thank you, President Executive, for inviting government to be part of the activities marking the official opening of your 75th annual conference. The Prime Minister could not be here because I think, well, most of us may know, the budget was presented yesterday. And it is, it is not because she stood and spoke for five and a half hours that causes her not to be here. It is that after speaking in the presence of the leader of the opposition, then it is right, it is the right thing to do to be there as he delivers his response. And so we, there are certain things you don't play politics with. Some things are just the right thing to do. And so she has asked me to stand in for her. I don't know even if that is possible. But when you have a boss, you do what the boss says once it doesn't offend your principles. The NUPW is celebrating 75 years of existence. Well, this is the 75th annual conference. Your 75 years would have, the anniversary would have been in January. Celebrating when you would have changed from, or you would have been established as the Civil Service Association and subsequently would have changed your name, but not your mission, to the National Union of Public Workers. And I would want to say to you that this Barbados Labour Party government identifies with the National Union of Public Workers. And it does so because it is a union, it is a party formed out of the struggle of workers to better themselves and to have improved conditions of existence. Our party, and I heard a, a speaker earlier refer to 
I think it was the Chargé d'Affaires, to Israel Lovell, Clement Payne, and Grantley Adams. And I think those who are familiar with the history of the labor movement would know that after Clement Payne was deported, then the gentleman who founded our party took up the battle on behalf of the workers. And so the Barbados Labor Party remains committed to fighting for workers. What I need to point out, and I, I think this is not a, I'm not giving a history lesson, but I need to point out that as a party, the leaders at the time recognized that workers, that there could be a blurring of the lines. And so even though the party would have been born out of the struggle of workers, the party understood that workers' organizations, organizations that were fully dedicated to the struggle of the workers needed to be created. And so the Barbados Labor Party would have formed, even though the leadership was the same, the No Right Excellence Sir Grantley and the No Right Excellence Sir Hugh Springer, the leadership was the same, but workers needed to have a dedicated organization to fight on their behalf. I want on your 75th, at the commencement of your 75th annual conference, to congratulate you for being a founding member, <coughs> excuse me, of CITUSAB. And uh, this would have been back in the 90s, early 1990s, but also for your continued participation in the process of social dialogue in Barbados. You have been at the table as Brother Kenny would have indicated, that dialogue we have formalized in the form of the social partnership. And this social dialogue embodied in the social partnership, but not limited to the social partnership, has been part of the industrial relations framework of Barbados for now many decades. It has served Barbados well, it has worked to move forward our economic development, and it still does, and it still does serve Barbados well. And I'm happy that as a party, as a government, we recognize that the sequence of events last May, even though last May now seems to be so long ago, was that the elections were Thursday, we got results on a Friday. Those of us who serve in cabinet were called on Saturday. We were sworn in on Sunday. And the prime minister said to me, we have a meeting Monday morning at 10 o'clock with the social partnership. We understood and still understand that if we are going to govern well, then people have to be included. If we are to govern well, then the partners have to be part of the governing process. We knew we had to move quickly because we had substantial challenges to face. But we had to move quickly with the coming together of the members of the social partnership. And so the social partnership of which the National Union of Public Workers is an integral part has been part of the process of governing and of getting us to the point where we believe we are on track for rescuing, but not just rescuing, rebuilding and transforming our country. As a matter of fact, the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Program was refined at the table with the social partners. And that program, the program which has been supported by the International Monetary Fund with the extended fund facility, a four-year facility, which we are now a part of, recognized, and not just because it was led by a party that recognizes the struggle of workers, but because workers and their representatives were at the table. That plan had at its core that workers, workers in Barbados, would not bear the brunt of any adjustment. Even though we knew 
that there had to be significant adjustment in our country and how we functioned as a country. But that plan determined that workers would not, as happened in previous years, 81 to 83, 91 to 93, 94, and then again over the last decade, we determined that workers, and when I say we, I mean we, the social partnership, determined that workers would not bear the brunt of any adjustment. And so at the beginning of the process, we sought to implement some revenue raising plans, programs, because there was a significant deficit that needed to be addressed. And so we believe that even the process of revenue raising had to be a shared process. Shared by capital, businesses, even, and that included room taxes, but also shared by those who visit our shores. We would have increased the departure tax, and so those who may not have contributed to where the country was, but we wanted them to understand that they were also stakeholders in our recovery. And so they bore some of the burden as well. Those of us who work and live in Barbados also bore some of the burden as it related to the, the levy and the contributions that were increased at that time. The process of closing a gaping hole could not be done only by raising revenue. And as a, a part in opposition, we would have indicated to the country that it is not possible to tax your way out of a recession. And so we knew that there had to be significant expenditure reductions. And as a government and as a partnership, we agreed and I, I know the, all the partners were there, including the president of the Bankers Association. We agreed that because government's debt service is such a significant portion of the expenditure of a government, if we were to avoid a situation where five or six or 10,000 persons would be forced to be separated from the service, we would have to address the matter of government's debt service. It was not a new idea. It was one that, was, that had been mooted by persons in the previous government. It was also one that was spoken to by the one who I succeeded as a representative. And so we spent quite a bit of time, quite a bit of sweat. I don't think it came to any blood, but just sweat and tears. We were able to agree a debt restructuring that saved Barbados and will save Barbados into the billions of dollars over time. And only after we had done that did we take the painful step of having to separate persons from employment in the public service. That was not a step that caused us any happiness, any glee, because a government that wins almost 80% of the votes cast in an election, when persons are separated from the public service, some or many of those have to be people who voted for us. And as representatives, we hear the stories, we hear the experiences of the pain that persons are having to experience at this time. And I don't want to dwell too long on it, but you would have heard of the various programs that we have started to and will continue to put in place to mitigate the fallout from that retrenchment exercise. As a matter of fact, the Prime Minister yesterday would have spoken quite, well, at quite length, much length about the matter of growth growth in the economy, getting Barbados back to work, and getting Barbadians back to work. 
as the Minister of Labor and as a person with some background in people management, I keep saying that I, I don't like by the Merle, I don't like the, the term human resources at all because human resources for me places people in the same category as machines and land. I don't think they're equal. I refer to people like me or you who work as workers because we're human beings. And, but as Minister of Labor, I would want to say to you that there, there have been a couple of missteps in that retrenchment program. And as a government, we do not deny if we err. If we err, we face it. And as, our, as we have done in our party before, we have a bit of a model called face it and fix it. And that is what we seek to do. We do not run away from the fact that we may have made miss some missteps along the way. Persons leaving employment and not having their funds with them. I think, though, that you would know that, and I, I don't want to say this sanctimoniously, but no politician would have been day-to-day -day responsible for those technical matters. I'm not casting blame anywhere. All I'm saying is that sometimes how these processes roll out speak to how we feel about people and about workers. And I want to say to not just leaders in the public sector, but also leaders in the private sector, that workers are people, are human beings, and have to be treated as such. And so the, the taking of lists and sending it by WhatsApp to all kinds of people in all over the place only serves to make people nervous, uncomfortable, and you start to wonder what is happening. Those kinds of things affect human beings, workers, in a significant way. And I would want to encourage leaders in all sectors and leaders at all levels to treat workers with respect and treat workers as the human beings that they are. In our attempt as a government to do just that, and to practice what we preach. I would want also to assure that, to assure all of you that the government is, as we speak, working to resolve the matter of those persons from BIDC who were separated from employment, who were terminated, who were sent home. And we are working to ensure that payments that are due are made in the shortest possible time. The attorneys are at work, and they are working to resolve the matter even as we speak. Because those former workers are human beings, and they deserve to be treated as human beings. As we work through our economic challenges, I would want to encourage all of us to steer the course. We are at the beginning of a program. We have been in office for 10 months, but the program that we are embarked on is a program that would have started officially in October of 2018. And so we are at the beginning of the program, and we want to say that even if we see start to see green shoots, we have to stay the course, because green shoots do not produce ears of corn. Only mature plants produce ears of corn. So I want to encourage us to stay the course. Barbados, as a member of the International Labor Organization, supports Sustainable Development Goal number eight, which speaks to sustainable economic growth and decent work. We've signed on to the Decent Work Agenda, and that agenda includes labor standards, it speaks to rights at work, it speaks to greater opportunities for men and women, 
And I think our massive ceremonies spoke quite eloquently to the involvement of women in the workforce and at the highest levels. The Decent Work Agenda also speaks to effective social protection. And it speaks to strengthened social dialogue. This government is on board fully with these Sustainable um, Development Goals, SDGs as they are called, and number eight in particular. And uh, whenever I speak to decent work, even though it has its definition according to the ILO, I think that as Barbadians, we have an idea of what is decent. We grow up hearing the word decent. And without anybody having to explain to us, we know what decent work should include. A decent place to work. Decent rewards for work. Decent in our response to those who supervise us. And being decent to those who we supervise. Decent work means that people have to treat each other as human beings and also understand that we are all part of a team working in the same direction. As minister, I am, even though an advocate for workers, very cognizant of the reality that businesses face. And I want to say that businesses, and I think I'm reiterating something that I heard earlier, maybe Sister Burt, I'm not sure, Businesses and other organizations, because businesses are not the only employers, businesses, government as the largest employer, and the one most relevant this evening, and also organizations in the civil society or third sector space must recognize that people are the engine of activity, the engine of growth, the engine of the development of any organization. Because even if an organization is fully automated, it is fully automated because there is somebody who programmed those things that caused the automation. So at the end of the day, people are significant in the process of building organizations, building capacity, but ultimately building countries and building economies. Even though I'm speaking at the 75th, the start of the 75th Annual Conference of the National Union of Public Workers, I want to say something to the private sector. It has become customary, and I do not want to say fashionable, because that may not be the case. But when there are separations in the public sector, it appears as if they are almost, it is almost followed immediately by separations in the private sector. I want to say to the private sector, to all of you gathered, to Barbados generally, that the spirit of the social dialogue that we are engaged in, the spirit of the agreement to rebuilding our country and growing our economy, suggests that we are in this together and that we are going to share in the pain so that in the not too distant future, we can share in the benefits. And so I do want to encourage the private sector to use layoffs, separations as a last resort. Government has being a partner, and uh, as recently as right at the end of last year, you would have heard that corporation taxes were reduced, not because we had initially planned to, and not because, as the opposition leader said before he left parliament, because of any ad hoc approach to economic planning, but because we found out after coming into office that a commitment was made on behalf of Barbados that there would be a convergence of tax rates. And so corporation taxes were reduced. And I would want to 
suggests to the private sector that with corporation taxes reduced, we expect that you would understand that there is a certain responsibility that government expects of you, and so we would want you to intensify your understanding that the process that we are engaged in is going to be a shared process if it is going to be a successful process. The NUPW's theme, 75 years of consistent representation and growing with technology. That suggests to me that after 75 years, the NUPW, in order to reach that point, would have stayed the course. You, you cannot get to 75 unless you've stayed the course. I am impressed. I saw it for the first time on Sunday, I think at the church service. And I was impressed because there is sometimes an erroneous view out there that trade unions are stuck. And the MC moved the paper that he had. But there is this view that is in the minds of some people that trade unions are stuck. And I want to say to you that the theme you chose really says to me, and I hope it says to Barbados, that the National Union of Public Workers understands that times are changing. And the National Union of Public Workers understands that even though times are changing, and a trade union has to change with the times, it understands that changing with the times does not necessarily mean compromising your principles. Principles are fixed. How we relate to various activities and situations can change while principles remain fixed. You've recognized that technology is really very important. I remember very clearly what Brother Kenny referred to. He didn't mention this, and maybe because there's still a sensitivity because of two recent tragic incidents. But there was the, the sensitivity. People were thinking that maybe they should not be in the air. Then 1999 rolled over into 2000. But there is an understanding that technology is moving us forward. Technology has moved us in the past maybe decade or two faster and further than we, those here maybe over 35, would have thought possible. Technology is an onward march. And if we don't change, we will be left behind. There is the now famous story of the Kodak company. Kodak was a leader when he was a youngster in camera and film. And the story, as I understand it, is that somebody brought the digital camera or the idea of a digital camera to Kodak. And they thought <laughs> that was some figment of somebody's imagination. Maybe like those of us who grew up on Dick Tracy seeing the computer watch. But when I was a little boy, that I felt was a figment of somebody's imagination. The Kodak company no longer exists. But there are still cameras, none of them using film. Times change. We have to change. I use that example because cameras still exist. And I said earlier that principles don't change, but methods do. And so while we can still record still images for posterity, the method in which it is done has changed significantly. And so the choice of your theme for this annual conference, I think, says, speaks volumes about your thinking. I would have, in that vein, to say to you that people also think differently about work sometimes. And uh, I'm not sure what the 12 hour day is, but workers have said to us, some workers, that they would prefer to work four 10-hour days and get three off days, as an example. Because people recognize that there are 
obligations that they have, their thinking may be different, their lives may have developed a, a different pattern. And, and so we, we have, even as we march forward, recognizing that we have to protect the rights of workers, we also have to understand that thinking in the minds of some workers and organizations are also changing. And also, Sister Delcia, it may also mean that without doing harm or injury to the idea of a 40-hour week, because this Barbados Civil Party government remains very resolute as it relates to a 40-hour week. But as the world changes, then, and here I speak maybe a bit as a former tourism professional, where there was work to be done every day of the week. And because there's work to be done every day of the week, then scheduling is done for 40 hours, but over five days, any five days of the week. Now, I am not prejudicing any discussion, but I just thought that since you invited me to speak, that I would share my own thoughts on that without appearing to be pushing you in any particular direction. I spoke earlier to respect for workers. And I would want to say to leaders in the public sector, I want to commend to all of us who are leaders in the public sector to take the example of our Prime Minister seriously. And so when the Sanitation Service Authority, as it discussed the matter of overtime, and I heard what Brother Alf said, but while discussing the matter of overtime or the matter of any five of seven, the Prime Minister did not believe that she was too high and too mighty to go to the Sanitation Service Authority and speak to the workers. She did not think she was over and above going to meet with transport board workers. It is because in our DNA, workers are people, people to be respected, people to, to be engaged with, and people who we share ideas together, even though we know that as a government, we still have to lead. And so without neglecting the fact that we have ultimately to make decisions and lead, we understand at the level of Prime Minister, myself as well, and other ministers of government, that we have to engage workers. We have to treat workers with the respect that they deserve. Barbados is moving to develop a modern economy along the same lines as your theme speaks to. We are in advance, at an advanced stage of discussions with the Inter-American Development Bank as it relates to the modernization of the public service. And I want to emphasize that we are speaking to the modernization of the public service and not the digitization of the public service. That which we are attempting to do has far more wider reaching impacts than just digitizing documents. We want to improve, to make processes more efficient. We want to be operating as if we were really on the cusp of the third decade of the 21st century and not operating in the 1950s or 1960s scenario. And so as we move to modernize our economy and the way our government works, that change is going to be driven by innovation and by improvements in efficiency. It means that some jobs will change. It means that new jobs will become part of the landscape. We're not talking about, well, we have been for a few years talking about the green economy. We're not talking about the blue economy. We're also talking about the creative economy, cultural industries, areas that 
five, ten years ago, we were not speaking about. But part of modernizing has to do with using technology, using innovation, but also embracing new concepts, new ways of doing things, new industries. It will mean that our educational system will have to change to adapt to the new realities. I want to, and politicians sometimes talk too long, so I want to sit down at this point, but not before I congratulate you for having passed your 75th anniversary and for today officially opening your 75th annual general conference. I want to commend the work that you have done over these 75 plus years. I want to thank you for being part of the social dialogue, the social partnership, for inputting in the discussions that we have frequently now, more frequently than you would have had before. But I want to thank you for, for coming to the table, staying at the table, and sharing your views, sometimes very loudly. And even the ones among us who are small in stature sometimes speak very loudly. But I want to thank you because the interaction is what produces the progress. I finally want to say to you that as you've started your 75th year of existence, the fact that you're still around means that you've stayed the course. As you go forward, I want to ask you to continue to stay the course. Thank you.